So good evening and welcome to the first public seminar of Trinity Term 20, uh, 2019 uh, here at Blackfriars Main Aula uh, of University of Oxford. And this event is our first in Ramsey Centre seminar of the term. We're very grateful to welcome Thomas J. Ord, uh, who'll be speaking to us on the subject, God Can't Stop Evil Single-Handedly. Uh, I think I put a question mark into some of the publicity, but uh, this is actually, he gave it to us as a statement, God can't stop evil single-handedly. Uh, and uh, Thomas J. Ord is a theologian, philosopher, and scholar, a scholar of multidisciplinary studies. He's a best-selling and award-winning author, having written or edited more than 25 books. He's a 12-time faculty award-winning professor. He teaches at institutions around the globe. And we're very lucky because he was coming to Europe to do a grand tour and through a series of providential coincidences, uh, we were able to get him here this evening. Uh, he's known for his contributions to research on love, on open and relational theology, science of religion, and the implications of freedom and relationships for transformation. So please would you welcome Thomas J. Ord. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you to Ralph for putting this together, and also to Sean Hinson, who's in the back. He was the one who had the idea of kind of putting this together, so I appreciate you three especially, and thanks to all of you for coming out this afternoon. I want to throw some wild ideas at you, ideas I think are quite helpful, ideas that I actually think are true, but you don't have to agree with me, um, ideas that I hope will spark in you an imagination of who God might be and who we might be in relation to God. Obviously, my title is a bit provocative for some people. God simply can't stop evil single-handedly. I first proposed this uh, idea in some previous books and more fully in a book a few years ago I titled The Uncontrolling Love of God. It was published by an academic press and although I tried very hard to write for a, an audience, uh, my mother didn't understand it. And so um, this particular book sold well, influenced quite a few people, and some folks got together and decided they wanted to do a book of essays that explored some of the implications from the ideas of the uncontrolling love. And about 80 theologians, philosophers, there's even a few scientists, an artist, some pastors, wrote short essays in this book called Uncontrolling Love. But these particular books, especially the first one, um, wasn't the kind of book that your average person would read. And I wanted to write that kind of book. In fact, some of the people who had read the first one, many of them were helped, said, you need to write in language most people can understand. And so this latest book called God Can't uh, came out in January, and that's been aimed at this particular audience. I thought I'd begin today to give you an idea of the impact of this book in the short time it's already been out by reading to you two brief email notes I received from readers of God Can't. I've got tons and tons of notes that I've, I've uh, collected. But I thought that perhaps beginning this way would help you grasp the importance of the word can't, because I think that's the one that's probably most uh, unusual. God can't stop evil single-handedly. One woman wrote and said this, I've always heard people speak of God allowing something. It's never set well with my soul. If God allows one thing, then where do we stop with how much he does allow, good or bad? If God can control, well, where do we stop with that idea? I've never been able to accept that he controls or even allows because that meant God allowed my childhood torture. He did not exercise control to stop it. Unacceptable. This bad view of God has left me to drift in and out of a crisis of faith. I thought God was controlling or allowing, and I had no other way to conceptualize this. I was told it wasn't okay to ask hard questions. But the idea that God can't completes what I've not been able to articulate. Second note. 
So I will tell you a bit about my story. I'm a survivor of sexual abuse, a lot, and for a long time by my brother. In the midst of the worst years of my life, I had a very vivid dream of God walking over to my bed as I was being raped. He simply reached out and held my hand and cried. For a few short days, I was elated. God hadn't left me after all. Then came the anger. Anger that he was there, and instead of stopping it, he simply held my hand and watched. For a long time, years, I was angry about that. I prayed for a breakthrough, but I never got it. So I buried it. Now, paging through your book, praying and contemplating, I can see more clearly what may have been happening. God could not stop my brother because God gives free will. How would he have stopped him? The reality is that God couldn't, not that he didn't. For me, this is a complete game changer. Couldn't, not didn't. That's a very different way of thinking about God than most people have been accustomed to hearing. In fact, if you're like me and you read the Bible a lot, you look to Scripture to get your primary clues about who God is and how God acts. But also, if you're like me and you've read the Bible enough, you'll know there's not a lot of clear answers to this particular issue. In fact, one of the most influential Bible scholars in the United States, a guy named Bart Ehrman, uh, looked at Scripture front to back on the question of God's uh, of evil, and he calls his book God's Problem. I think Bart's a particularly interesting character because he grew up an American fundamentalist. His first place of education was a place called Moody Bible Institute. Anybody ever heard of that? Few of you. Pretty conservative, pretty conservative. He then went and got a degree from Wheaton, did a PhD in New Testament at Princeton, and along the way, he found he couldn't believe in God anymore whether he calls himself an atheist or an agnostic. It wasn't, you know, finding out there were errors or differences in the oldest manuscripts of the Bible. It was the problem of evil that led him to the place where he could not and still cannot believe that there's a God. And so he writes this book. The subtitle, for those in the back who can't see it, says, How the Bible Fails to Answer Our Most Important Question, Why We Suffer. Near the end of this book, he says something I think is powerful. If there is a God, he's not the kind of being that I believed in as an evangelical, a personal deity who has ultimate power over this world and intervenes in human affairs to implement his will among us. He goes on, if God cures cancer, why do millions die of cancer. If the response is, it's a mystery, God works in mysterious ways, well that's the same as saying that we do not know what God does or what he's like, so why pretend we do? I think Bart Ehrman is not only expressing a concern that at least most polls say the number one reason atheists say they can't believe in God, I think Bart Ehrman is also giving voice to a concern that those of us who do believe in God share. That is, how can we make sense of this suffering? Today I want to stick my head way out and offer a solution. Now if you hang around with academics like I do, then that sounds like, if not preposterous, at least really cocky. <laughs> Most philosophers and theologians will offer a defense a defense is saying it's still justified, reasonably justified to believe in God, even though we can't give a good solution to the problem of evil. I want to go further. I want to say the proposal I lay on the table today actually solves the main issues in the problem of evil. Bold claim, I know. 
So my particular question is, what if God simply can't, not just won't, but can't stop or prevent evil single-handedly? It surprises many people to find out, especially people like me who read the Bible a lot, that there are quite a few biblical passages that simply say God can't do things. The writer of Hebrews says God can't tell a lie. James says God can't be tempted. Isaiah says God can't grow tired. My favorite passage is when uh, Paul is writing to Timothy, and he says this, When we are faithless, God remains faithful because God cannot deny himself. God cannot deny himself. There are certain things God simply can't do. Now, most Christian theologians have said God can't contradict the laws of logic. God, you know, can't make a married bachelor. Or uh, God can't lift, make a rock so big that even God can't lift it. But some of us go further and say God also can't contradict God's own nature. The proposal I'm going to offer you today is the idea that God's nature is a kind of love, and God can't contradict God's own nature. So we'll have to go into some details to that. Here's that particular passage if you're interested, 2 Timothy 2.13. God simply can't deny himself. To situate my proposal amongst other possibilities, other ways of thinking about God's action in the world, what many theologians call models of providence, I want to lay out seven that I think are fairly common and show you where mine fits. So here they are. On the far, I guess it's your far left, is God who does everything. Some versions of John Calvin's theology is this one. God does absolutely everything that occurs. You may think you have free will. You may think there are chance occurrences. You may think that uh, you know, other agents in the world are acting, but God is ultimately controlling all things. This one has a particularly difficult time, I think, solving the problem of evil because every last torture, murder, rape, genocide, God didn't just allow, God orchestrated. Number two is the one I think is most common in the churches I hang out with. In fact, most Christians I know have some version of this. This is the idea that God will give free will sometimes, but other times not. God does some things in the world. We do some things in the world. Other agents, actors, or animals might do some things. The devil and demons might do some things. It's sort of a, a pluralistic agency kind of approach in which sometimes God controls, but other times has a hands-off policy. I think one of the major problems with this is what I call explanatory inconsistency. You never know who's doing what and why. This is the one I think a lot of people who read my books have in the back of their mind. God is a God who gives us freedom sometimes, but God steps in and intervenes and controls other times, and why doesn't God do it a lot more often? Number three, God is voluntarily self-limited. This one is more common among science and religion scholars I hang out with. Many of these folks call themselves kenotic theologians, and I like the word kenosis. But this particular view of kenosis says that God voluntarily gives freedom to complex creatures, maybe agency to less complex creatures, maybe they're free processes to use the language of John Polkinghorne. But God could, if God wanted to, intervene to control something. And maybe God occasionally does to do miracles or really important stuff like resurrections. But most of the time, God is voluntarily self-limited. I think this is Jürgen Moltmann's view as well. The problem with this one, from my perspective, is that if God could prevent some evils, and maybe occasionally does, then we always have to ask, well, why not this one? Why not that one? Why not the Holocaust? Why not my sister's rape? Why not, yeah, 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 we just go down the line. This one, even most people in this particular camp admit, doesn't give us a consistent solution to the problem of evil. Number four is mine. It has all the answers, and I'll get to that later. <laughs> Number five is the idea that God is present in the world, and God is a necessary cause in all things that occurs, but God is not influenced by us. God is not relational. God isn't affected by our prayers and what we do. 
Uh, this is the god described by Paul Tillich or Gordon Kaufman. It's, I think, the god sort of assumed in Star Wars, you know, kind of like the force. It's there, you got to have it, but it's not really interacting in any kind of way. Number six is the god of deism, who started the things off a long time ago, and now is a current observer. And number seven is an appeal to mystery. Uh, in the most thoroughgoing fashion, it might be someone like Jacques Derrida. Um, I'll say something now that I'm sure Andrew is going to want to ask me about later. I think Thomas Aquinas' primary and secondary cause ultimately comes here. But I'm sure he'll ask me, he'll, he'll challenge me on that. However, even if it's not a thoroughgoing appeal to mystery, many of the folks over here play the mystery card when the going gets tough. When the, the, the uh, questions come down to this particular evil, or why did the world, God create the world in this particular way, they have certain kind of answers, but then they admit they have to reach in their back pocket and pull out a big M mystery card. Now, I want to say up front, I don't claim to have God figured out. <laughs> I think there's always a place for mystery in theology. But saying there's a mystery in the sense that we can't know God fully or even with certainty is different from the idea of pulling out the mystery card when you get painted into the corner on the problem of evil. Um, are you seeing a tense period of time for your words? Uh, I'll get to that. But uh, my particular proposal would. Many of the rest of them would not. Okay. Yeah. So... An example of, oops, let me go back. An example of someone in this category, someone I respect a great deal, John Polkinghorne. He's in the voluntarily self-limited model. He says this, God allows the created other to be and to act so that while all that happens is permitted by God's general providence, not all that happens is in accordance with God's will or brought about by special, divine special providence, such an understanding is basic to the interpretation of evolutionary history as creation's making of itself. Such an understanding is also basic to theodicy's disclaimer that God does not will the act of a murderer or the destructive force of an earthquake, but allows both to happen in a world in which divine power is deliberately self-limited, to allow causal space for creatures. Notice that allow language. I'm taking a further step by saying God simply can't stop evil. John would say God won't stop evil, or God permits evil, because it's a part of a larger project. <clears throat> I happen to agree with John Calvin's criticism of John Polkinghorne. Not that John Calvin knew John Polkinghorne, but that particular position. We should make no distinction between God's will in God's permission. What else is the permission of him who has the power of preventing and in whose hand the whole matter is placed but his will? Calvin is saying this. Okay, this distinction between God not wanting this to happen but allowing it so it's not God's will, that doesn't make any sense. If you've got the power to prevent it and you could stop it, then it's your will if you allow it. At least you're saying that option is better than the alternatives. I think he's right about that. This whole thing about not willing it, but allowing it, and somehow that being OK, doesn't make a lot of sense in our everyday life. I have three daughters. I live in Idaho. Behind my house, there's a stream. And my daughters like to go out in the back stream and play around when it gets hot in the summertime. Suppose one afternoon, I'll make it some spring, I'm in my backyard doing a bunch of yard work, which is already fictitious, but let's pretend like I'm back in my backyard doing yard work. I look up, and my oldest daughter has gotten so mad at my youngest daughter. She's taken her head, put it under the water, and is trying to drown her, to kill her. Now suppose I'm close enough, I could run out, intervene, and save my youngest daughter. But I say, you know, who am I to mess with my daughter's free will? I mean, God doesn't mess with our free will, even though God could. I'm just going to stand here. After all, I'm not willing this drowning. I'm not causing it. I'm just allowing it. 
Nobody in my subdivision would say, you know that Tom, he's such a great parent. What a loving guy. He just lets his kids kill each other. And yet, many people think that this willing versus permitting is a good distinction. I don't think it makes much sense, and that analogy suggests that. My proposal I call essential kenosis. The word kenosis is used in various passages of scripture, but probably the most famous one is in Philippians in a particular song or hymn in which Jesus is said to be self-emptying, taking the form of a servant, taking on death, even death on the cross. Um, and many, not just me, many scholars today will argue that Jesus' kenosis reveals that God is this kind of self-giving, others-empowering, sometimes self-emptying kind of love. I'm on the same page with other kenosis theologians on this point. What makes me different is I think God necessarily self-gives and others empowers. Most others think God does that contingently. In other words, God could decide not to. I think this essential kenosis comes first in God's nature, and God simply cannot deny himself. I'm bringing in that scripture again. Or to put it a little more technical kind of way, I think divine love is logically primary in the divine nature, such that all the other attributes must conceptually conform to love. And this love is self-giving, others empowering. Or another way, more common way to put it, God cannot control those God's loves. And God loves everyone and everything, so God can't control anyone or anything. Big claim. This is how it cashes out when it comes to evil issues. It says that God necessarily gives freedom to complex creatures like you and me and maybe dolphins and dogs and chimps and others. These gifts are, to use the language of Paul in Romans, irrevocable. So God simply cannot withdraw, override, or fail to provide this freedom to free perpetrators of evil, to those who use their freedom wrongly. But it goes beyond just the free will issue. It also says that God necessarily gives agency or self-organization to simpler entities in reality. And God simply can't fail to provide, withdraw, or override this agency even when those simpler entities cause evil in the world. In one of my books, I told a story about a guy in New York who was blogging. His wife was pregnant with their first child, it was a daughter. He had learned from the physician that his daughter had some very rare disease caused by, apparently by uh, random genetic mutations. If she was to li uh, be born alive, they would take her directly into surgery. And if the surgery was successful, they could look forward to multiple surgeries in this young girl's life. He goes to his rabbi and he says, what's going on here? He talks to people in his synagogue. They're telling him it's all a part of God's plan. He says, no one's free will has caused this. Don't bring the free will defense to me. This is something like going on at the quantum or not, the uh, genetic level. What about God fiddling there? Can't God prevent evil at that, at that level of existence? I'm making the claim that God even loves the smallest elements of reality. And that means God can't control them either. In fact, I would say what we call the laws of nature, or I call them the law-like regularities in the world, those are the necessary uh, expressions of God's love throughout all creation, and God simply cannot interrupt those law-like regularities to prevent evil or stop random events. Now, I remember several years ago, maybe 10, 12 I was proposing some of these ideas to some of my fellow philosophers at some philosophy societies. And this one philosopher stood up in the back and he says, you know, Tom, your God's a wimp. He says, I'm stronger than your God. If my four-year-old starts to go in my house toward the stove, and oh, let's say, yeah, stove, and is going to put her hand on the stove, I can reach out, take her hand, and pull it away she may freely want to touch the hot burner, but I interrupt it. I'm stronger than your God, Tom. What's the deal here? 
That comment got me to thinking about what I think about uh, what theologians and philosophers call God's composition or God's, uh, what's God, what is God constituted as. Most Christian and in other traditions as well, theologians have said God is incorporeal, which means God doesn't have a localized body like you and I do. God is a universal spirit. Biblical authors use phrases like uh, talking about God as uh, breath or mind or spirit or wind. Sometimes people today compare God to gravity, uh, all kinds of these things. It suggests that God doesn't have a localized body. Now, some of my uh, Mormon Christian friends think otherwise, but most of the Christian tradition has said, nope, God is an omnipresent universal spirit. I think that helps us then. That means that after this lecture, when Andrew and I are walking out on St. Giles Street, and we're involved in a great conversation, and he's telling me all the incredibly positive things I said in this lecture, and a truck is coming behind him, and of his own free will, he starts to turn to step into that truck, and I reach out and grab him by the shoulder and pull him back, that's a loving thing. I can do that because I have a body. God doesn't have a body. Now, I happen to think God calls upon me to use my body to pull Andrew back, so indirectly God is at play here, but God doesn't have the kind of body that I have to stop horrific things. So, to put it this, so then to put it in this kind of way, God is an omnipresent spirit with no localized divine, divine body, and although creatures sometimes use their bodies to prevent evil, God has no divine body. Okay, I mentioned that this sounds to some people like God is a wimp. <laughs> Let me address that question. I think this God can rightly be called almighty, but let me, let me quick, quickly preface this by saying there's no magic word to talk about God's power. Some people like the word omnipotent. Other people like the word sovereign. I happen to choose almighty because most English translators use the word almighty in the Bible. But I think God can be almighty and yet be unable to control others. God is almighty in three senses. God is mightier than all others. God has no rivals, to quite quote the psalmist. God is the one who exerts might upon all others. Say it philosophically, God's a necessary cause in the becoming of every entity and all reality. And God is the ultimate source of might for all others. We are utterly dependent upon God, and our power derives from God. God can be almighty in all three of these senses without being able to control creatures or creation. I want to uh, finish out today by talking about the five major ideas in this new book, God Can't. I'll go pretty quickly, but I want to give you an overview of how this all fits together. Because, well... Saying God can't prevent evil, I think, is only one part of a full solution to the problem of evil. In fact, it's kind of negative if you think about it. Like, here, I've solved the problem of evil. It's not God's fault. That's it? <laughs> There's got to be more. I mean, that's really important. But aren't there other factors as well? I want to look at some of those other factors. The first one, of, though, of course, is the idea that God simply can't stop evil single-handedly. Single-handedly, God can't do that. And this is a summary of what I've said so far. Jesus reveals God's canonic love as self-giving, others empowering, and therefore uncontrolling love. Essential kenosis says uncontrolling love comes logically first in God, and even though God is almighty, God's uncontrolling love preconditions or shapes God's power. So God simply cannot control creatures or creation. This next phrase, and I'm going to put up here, I'm guessing a lot of you are going to ask questions about this when we get to Q&A, so let me cue it up for you. I think God creates, acts miraculously, and saves now and at the eschaton through uncontrolling love. Number two, I also think God is a suffering God. God suffers with us. This is a fairly common theme in uh, many... Uh, theologies today. Because God is present and receptive everywhere, God feels pain and joy that creatures feel. 
And those who suffer because of genuine evil have God with them as the fellow sufferer who understands and feels their pain. A lot of theologians today have come to embrace the idea that God feels our pain with us. And I think that's really important. But many theologians stop there. They're not willing to go as far as I'm suggesting we should go by saying God simply can't single-handedly stop that evil in the first place. Suppose here in Oxford you have the first earthquake you've had in I don't know how many hundreds of years. And this room starts rocking and shaking and a big beam comes down right on Paul Wasson. Paul is on the floor. There's debris everywhere. This beam is across his chest. And I come up to Paul, and I see he's laying there, and he says, Tom, help me out. Help me. I can't breathe. And I look at the beam, and I realize that I'm strong enough to shove it off of Paul and save his life. But I say to myself, well, I've got a very classic view of God, a God who suffers but who can't control or doesn't always control, I think I'll just hold Paul's hand and let him die here, suffer with him, empathize with him in his pain. No one, his wife for sure, wouldn't call me a loving person if all I did was empathize when I could prevent the evil by saving his life. So as important as this is, I think it's also important to say God simply can't prevent evil single-handedly. We also then need to I'm sorry, imitate God by empathizing and sympathizing with victims. Third major idea. I live a weird life. I have some pretty conservative theological friends, folks from Pentecostal traditions that are conservative, Catholic traditions that are conservative, charismatic. I also have some pretty liberal friends, friends who don't always even want to call, use the word Christian for their, themselves. And when it comes to this healing question, I've got friends all across the board. In fact, let me use a, a specific illustration. I have a brother who's a Pentecostal who sees healings left, right, and center. I go to him over, I hang out with him over Christmas break, and he's telling me about how God healed him of this and that, and the people in this church were healed of this and that, and it's like, you'd think that God was like working overtime in his church because it ain't happening in my church. How do we account for why some people are healed, but many are not? Is God picking and choosing favorites? Is God saying, you know, Bethany, you've prayed 37 times, but until you pray 89 times, I'm not going to intervene and heal you. Is this the kind of God who punishes us? Who says, you know, John, I saw what you did last week. You're a sinner. I'm going to kick your butt this week. The pain you're going through is retribution for your sin in the past. The proposal I make in this particular chapter says this. God is constantly, always, 24-7, working to heal everyone and everything. But God can't heal single-handedly. There has to be cooperation at some level, whether conscious, cellular, muscle, society, quantum. There has to be some kind of cooperation, or if we're talking about inanimate structures here, the, the conditions must be appropriate for the kind of healing that God wants to do. God can't sing, heal single-handedly, so God works in tandems with entities, individuals, communities, and circumstance to bring healing and wholeness to the greatest extent possible. Some healing I don't think can occur in this life. At least <laughs> I've seen a lot of people die who weren't fully healed. I don't know about you. I also believe in an afterlife. I think some healing must wait until then. So that's the third major idea. The fourth one is that God is working to squeeze good from evil. And here I want to use an illustration of a woman who was a rock star superstar when I was a kid in America in, in growing up in evangelical circles. Her name, Johnny Erickson Tata. Johnny Erickson, as a teenager, was in the Chesapeake Bay with her family. She dove out of her boat and there was a rock just below the surface of the water. 
She broke her neck. She was paralyzed from the neck down. After spending some time in the hospital, she began to write about her experience. She wrote many best-selling books. She recorded albums. She went on the Christian speaking circuit. I saw her as a little kid. She would get up in her wheelchair and talk about God's love for her. She ended up learning how to paint with her mouth, and she's phenomenal. Not only that, Johnny Erickson is an excellent person. She's virtuous. She has so many of the things in my tradition that we call Christ-likeness. She's like Jesus in the way she acts in the world. However, I don't like her theology. <laughs> she wrote this on her blog a couple years ago. This was 50 years after she had been paralyzed. Often when I share my testimony, I reflect on how off track I had become in my Christian life before my diving accident. You know, I said recently, I was involved in some pretty immoral stuff when I was on my feet. Even though I was a Christian, I was sinning big time, heading down a wrong path. Deep in my heart, I know that if my accident hadn't happened, I would have completely ignored my convictions in college. Someone who was listening asked me, Johnny, are you saying that God was punishing you with a broken neck? It was a good question. My mind went to Hebrews 12, 6. The Lord disciplines those He loves, and He punishes everyone He accepts as a son. And I had to look that person straight in the eye and say, Yes, I believe God was punishing me for doing wrong. I think Johnny Erickson is a really amazing person who has a really amazingly wrong theology. I don't believe God punishes people by breaking their necks for their sins. In fact, I don't think God punishes people at all. I do think there are natural negative consequences for sin, and sometimes there are accidents that cause us pain and suffering. There's no one's sin whatsoever, but this is not God kicking your butt from what, for what you've done. So my view says this, genuine evil is not God's punishment, nor part of some plan, but God works with creation to squeeze some good out of the bad God didn't want in the first place. All the testimonials I hear about Jesus teaching me something positive because I went through something bad, I can say, yes, God does work with your rotten circumstances, but that's different from saying God caused or even allowed the bad to begin with. So God responds to suffering and evil by offering new possibilities, given what's possible, to grow, heal, mature, and learn. The final one this, this afternoon, God calls on us to join the work to defeat evil. I think we play a role here. God calls upon not only humans, but other creatures to cooperate with God to make a better world. And we should respond to this call by comforting the afflicted, consoling those in pain, working to convince those who act in evil ways to act instead for good, act to form people and structures and societies that minimize evil and promote good. So, the five aspects of this solution to evil. God simply can't single-handedly prevent evil. God empathizes with us in our suffering. God works to heal to the greatest extent possible. God works to squeeze good out of the bad God didn't want in the first place. And you and I play a role. We must cooperate with God's desire to heal and to redeem the world. Questions? Well, thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Um, we've got maybe up to 20 minutes or so of questions, and uh, if you'd like to wait until the microphone reaches you, then we'll catch your question as well. So any, uh, any questions? Um, Simone Weil. Do you know Simone yes. Weil? Yeah. It sound, it, it, I get the feeling that sh she was heading in the di direction that you're heading. Is, is that right? Yeah. And also, like and, and before you answer me, yeah. <laughs> there's a wonderful painting, I don't know, at Keeble College. Have you seen that? Where so. there's a, oh, what's it called? Christ and the, and the Lantern. And, and 
light, the light of the world. Mm. And he's knocking, and he's knocking on a door, mm -hmm. and there's no handle. He can't open the door. Mm -hmm. The door has to be opened from the other side. It's a, yeah. Yeah, I, I've, I've, I know that painting. Uh, you know, I, I read Simone Weil about 20 years ago, and I felt a connection with her. I don't think she said explicitly what I've said here today, but I, I would agree with you that she's moving that direction. <laughs> Um, it's just um, said that God can't um, stop evil, like, um, but it's not a logical problem. Plan to have solved it. Um, and it's not sitting here on the email. I mean, it's difficult with an email um, that um, the usual answers are unsatisfactory. No, I think of satisfactory in many different ways. I think of satisfaction of um, a model, and that's effectively what Plantica did. There's no contradiction between God's power. Yeah, I think uh, Al did a, I, I think Al convincingly argued that there's no logical contradiction between believing that God exists and genuine evil occurs. Yes. I think he gives a defense for why one might believe in God and still yeah, not, think not evil. Yeah, not exactly. It's not a feel, a feel, feel, feel dicey at all. I'm aware, well aware yeah, of that. Yeah, so. It just seems it's a bit strange to weaken God's power to that extent, when the fact is it's not a logical problem. Yeah. Um, satisfactory um, can mean anything, whether it's psychologically, um, personally sat satisfactory for you. I mean, you can be pathological, um, not pathological, my mind's gone there. But <laughs> <laughs> you can actually be satisfied with something that's wrong. I mean, a, a, a very simple case. I was at the recent book launchings of um, the Ian Ramsey Centre Studies in Science and Religion. One book was by Aston McGrath. The other one was a collection edited by John Harrison. Hmm. Um, I picked up the books, and perhaps it's my Asperger's playing me up. I don't know. But the books were different. Were dimensions were different. It wasn't that one was thicker than the other. The actual dimensions were different. Mm -hmm. And I made a, I tried to re rationalise this, and I thought, well, one's a monograph, and one's a collection. Perhaps what it's going to be, the collection's going to be have have a larger area than the monographs but I spoke to the, the publisher. He said, no, it was simply an um, economic decision. Mm. The, the, the collection was an awful lot bigger and it was actually cheaper to have it that size mm. rather than making them both, you know, you know it was just a purely yeah. economic condition. So I had a very psychologically satisfying answer to that, but it was wrong. Yeah. And I'm always slightly concerned with um, these alt alternative concepts of God. It's the fact that they are not correct. They're just psychologically appealing. Yeah, you make some great points. I don't want to stand up here and say, I've got the right answer and everyone else is wrong. And I know it with certainty. Yeah. I do want to say this. I think my answer is more plausible than any of the alternatives, including Al's. I, There's well, a difference between possible. logical possibility kind of and plausibility. Okay. Point is, by limiting God's power to that extent, um, can God create from nothing? Excellent question. Yeah, that, that's, you know, that's a standard question. I was just, look, just working through some equations of ge on general relativity here and um, on the, something called the bohr gerth flanken theorems. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're I'm familiar, familiar, with, familiar, them. familiar yeah. with them. Yeah. All dual descendants actually end, basically. You know, they can't go back forever. And I was thinking, well, if God's not all powerful, he can't really start anything. Mm. He can only act on what's already there. And yeah. then let me address that, and then let me go to some of the other ones. Um, I do reject creation out of nothing. Now, I think I have biblical grounds to do so. Even most people who accept creation out of nothing admit that the Bible doesn't explicitly require one to believe that. They do so for various historical reasons or they think it's plausible. Uh, I'm about halfway through writing a book in which I argue that God always creates in each moment out of that which God previously created and that creative process is everlasting. So it'll be a new proposal on the table. So, 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 so I'm afraid we'll have to move, move on to the next uh, <laughs> question. Um, Good stuff, thank you. Hi, Tom. Thanks. Sure. The word single-handedly. Yeah. Uh, I don't think you've unpacked it sufficiently for no. me. Um, 
Because it suggests, and I think rightly, that we have a part to play. Yes. And you've, and you've come on and said that. Mm -hmm. So is, is that the case, that God yes. is working towards an aim, he's expressing his will, he may be expressing that will within me through his spirit, but he actually says also, John, you need to push the door. Yes. For it to open. Yes. And then I'll open it. Thank you for asking that question. It helps me to clarify some things. One of the things that sometimes people say when they hear my proposal and they misunderstand it is they will say this, well, your God can't act unless we do something. That's not my view. My view says God always acts, necessarily. In fact, necessarily creates, to go back to that question. <laughs> but in order for things to be determined in the world, there has to be some response, some cooperation. There has to be something there. And the analogy I like to use is the analogy of when I acted to say to my fiancé, would you marry me? Now, no one was forcing me. I did that action all myself. But in order for the marriage to become a reality, she had to say yes. In order for this marriage to be a good one, we have to continually say yes to one another. So I can act, but that's different from determining that the marriage is a reality. Analogously, God always acts, but in order for, determine to, for things to be determined in actual existence, there has to be a response or some kind of uh, tandem working. Just, may I just pick up a point there, because you're, you're playing in a field where a lot of people have uh, had a go. Yes. Uh, my, my, my supervisor, Eleanor Stump, she's written a book on, on the problem of suffering uh, called Wandering in Darkness. Uh, I wonder whether you had any comment about her work. You may, you may not be aware of it, or I, I imagine I you probably have at some point. I don't know it well, but I'm, I'm familiar with it, yeah. Whether well, you had any comments or views? Um, if I understand her position correctly, at the end of the day, she is in the mystery camp. I don't think she can quite say she provides a solution to it. Um, the details, uh, you obviously probably know better than I do, but... Um, yeah, I think, well, she, she qualifies everything she says, so of course, uh, as all good philosophers do. Um, but it really touched on this issue, like you mentioned with your marriage with your wife. There are yeah. certain kinds of things that are not actualized in the world without uh, two or more persons. Yeah, uh, well, that's I good to hear. It's, I didn't it's, know it's very relational, her account. Excellent. So you might be interested in engaging with that. Thank you, then. Andrew. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Yes. Uh, there are two, th two things I was thinking about um, when, when we say that God um, cannot or would not stop single-handedly, uh, the evil. The definition of the evil, the evil can, something can be evil from one's eye, but it may not be evil from another eye is the, is the one thing. The second thing is... How about if I answer that one and then we'll go to your second one? Can I do that? That way I don't forget the first one. <laughs> right. So I define evil as any event that all things considered make the world worse than it might have been. Now, in order to know with certainty what that is, one would have to have omniscience. Mm -hmm. One would have to have a, a global perspective. I don't claim to have that. <laughs> right. So only from a God's eye view can we know if any particular event is genuinely evil. However, this is important, however, you and I, if I were to hang out with you for very long, we all inevitably act as if we think some things in the world are genuinely evil. In other words, even people who run around and say, you know what, it's all good, all the bad stuff is really good from God's perspective, the way they act presupposes they think otherwise. If you punch them in the nose, they're mad about that. So I call that an experiential non-negotiable. So I think genuine, I have a definition of genuine evil, and then I make the argument that we all presuppose genuine evils in our actions, even if we deny them verbally. So okay. second question. Now, the second part is, according to Asian theology, God, word God, G-O-D, God, generator, operator, and distractor, or, or destroyer. Interesting. Right. Now, the God, when we say the God is not doing anything, or doing something, if something, somebody is doing bad, so God is not stopping it. Yeah. If we see from another angle, from the angle of destructor or destroyer, he's using his power, that power. 
one hand, he's using the power of generating, and then operating, and then destroying. We see it as destruction. Let's, let me give an example. An old building has been destroyed. From one angle, oh, the building has been destroyed. But the planner has a beautiful plan to destroy it and make a more magnificent building. So it is the eye, it is the angle, it is the lens that see it and translate it. This is in a way I'm coming from. We, sometimes we say, oh, God can't do it, won't do it. From maybe, it could be, from the God's point of view, he is using his all powers at the right time and in his wisdom what is right. Okay. That's okay. definitely a possibility. It's not a, a proposal I find attractive, but I definitely want to say that's a possibility. <laughs> Thank you, Tom, for sure. this exposition. Yes. Um, I'm wrestling with this, of course, existentially as well as theologically, philosophically. Most proposals I've heard are always solving the, what we call the theodice, is God just, with taking out the trilemma, uh, the three claims. God is all power, God is love, and evil has no meaning. Can, I mean, it's evil in essence. And again, you do the same for me. You just keep to love and evil is evil. And you start doubting his almightiness from a other perspective. I mean, yes. so I'm looking for someone that really can solve by keeping the tree without getting into the tree lemma. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Mathematically, thank you. but yeah. I didn't find that I appreciate yet. your honesty. Yes. <laughs> um, so you took the opposite. One thing I'm wrestling with is the kenosis idea. Mm. Uh, I'm very close to Brunner and mm. Mom and Pannenberg on mm -hmm. that. And I see a difference in your opinion there. Yes. What you do, and this is my question, and I have another question related to that, is it's a verb in the New Testament. Mm. Kineo. Yeah. It's never a noun. You make it into a noun. God mm. is kenosis. Yeah. I will go if I go that direction, I would say he decides mm. to become kenosis, uh, okay. keeping his almightiness, yes. and maybe eschatologically too. So this decision for me is important, because now you make him a noun kenosis, and I have difficulty yeah. with that. It I, also hey, I've got no, it works better for me to make it a verb, so <laughs> i got no problem going with a verb. And then <laughs> commenting on that, how do you see the first chapter of the book of Job? Okay, you've yeah, got lots uh, of questions a, there, let yeah, me there's see two if questions. I can, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, to go to your first one in the trilemma, I am rethinking God's power. I still have an almighty God, but you're right, it isn't a God who's capable of being what philosophers would call a sufficient cause. The word I'm using is the word control, unilaterally determined, single-handedly, all those kinds of phrases. But I'm trying to say this is still a very powerful God, uh, but not that usual way. Second thing, kenosis. Um, I see my view as standing between two other options. Well, many other options, but two in particular. One, the voluntary self-limitation that Polkinghorne and I think Moltmann has. The other one is the idea that God is externally limited by metaphysical laws, principalities and powers, uh, the God-world relationship. Charles Hartshorn called it the God-world social relationship. Uh, creativity, there's all kinds of things. A lot of process folks use that language. I see myself as between those two by saying it isn't external powers that are limiting God, but it's also not a voluntary choice on God's part. It's that God's very nature begins logically with love, and this love is self-giving and others empowering. So it's an alternative between those, but it's not with Moltmann over here because of what I've already said about the problems of divine self-limitation. Job, there's a ton of things I could say about that, but just let me say, start with this. Um, I think the beginning of Job is bad theology. <laughs> God sitting around playing poker with the evil one, and God starts to brag. Checked out Job, what an amazing guy he is. Evil one says, oh, come on, Job's just figured out the game. He's figured out that if you're a good person, you end up living a good life. But I'll tell you what, if his life goes bad, he'll curse you and die. God says, bring it. I'll take that bet, buddy. 
I don't think God makes bets with the devil. I do think, however, the book of Job as a whole tells us something incredibly important that actually stands in juxtaposition to other uh, biblical passages, and that is bad things can happen to good people. That's the theological message out of Job that I take. Great questions. Thank uh, In your scheme, it's not clear how God actually acts in the world. Mm. It's not clear to me, yes. at least. So I want to say uh, it's, it's hard to describe divine action, even for people who don't agree with me. <laughs> and here are some of the problems with describing God's action. One, if you think God is omnipresent, which most believers do, how are you going to point out where God is acting and no one else is acting? Secondly, if you think God cannot be perceived by your five senses, which again, most Christians, Muslims, and Jews think, how are you going to look around or put into a microscope and see, well, God acted there? It seems to me what you have to do is have to have a philosophical hypothesis. And that hypothesis is going to suggest whatever we mean by God's action, it's not going to be perceptible by our five senses, and we're not going to be able to isolate some instances in which God acts and other instances in which there's no action whatsoever. The best we can do, beginning with a hypothesis that God is omnipresent and active everywhere, is to ask this question. Do we think what we actually do see in the world reflects love, beauty, truth, the kinds of common things we typically ascribe to God. If we think we do, then we say, in those instances, God not only acts, but there was good response. So my answer to you is, philosophically, I want to say God's a necessary cause for every activity in all of reality. Empirically, we can't see that in any kind of way, but we can see and make judgments, obviously. We can't make these judgments perfectly that some things are more loving, some things are evil, and then we make the hypothesis, at least I make the hypothesis, that God was responded to well in loving circumstances, but God's will was rejected in unloving ones. Great question. Who was next? Five more minutes. Um, yeah. General Trump, and then at the back. Um, we're going to try to finish at about five minutes. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your talk. Yeah, you're I'd welcome. I'd like to ask your opinion, please, on the, the resurrection. Mm. Do you think God did that single-handedly? No. Can you, I'm not trying to understand what yes. you think of that. Please. Something I've been working on for a while. I've published some on this idea. Um, obviously, there's lots of speculation because none of us was there. But um, I do believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Now, the question is, okay, if whatever happened there... What is cooperating with God? Now, there's a lot of mind-body you know, theories out there. A very common one among some Christians is there's a, a, a soul-body difference. Uh, I happen to be a dual-aspect monist, but I won't go down that road. But the point is this. Most people, including most Christians, think that Jesus' mind or soul or spirit continued existing even when his body was dead in the grave. If that's the case, which I have no problem believing that, then that would want to cooperate with God. So it's not like Jesus is not going to cooperate with God, assuming he's sinless. That's going to have an effect not only upon the body, but also play a major role in the body, the resurrection. So then I have to make a really wild speculation. And let me go on record to say this is getting wild here, all right? I have to say there must be some cooperation with Jesus' body. Now, if Jesus had been dead years and there was lots of decay, it would be really hard for my hypothesis. But a person who's dead 36 hours, not so hard. Plus, there's really interesting things in Scripture that I start to notice when I have this hypothesis on the table. Matthew's Gospel. In Matthew's Gospel, an angel rolls away the stone. I mean, if God can resurrect Jesus, why send an angel to move the stone out of the way? Why not just do that single-handedly too? Other things that begin to trouble me, when I look at the accounts of the resurrection, the resurrected Jesus, these are really wild. I mean, whatever kind of body this is that comes out ain't the same kind that went in. <laughs> it can go through 
rooms. It can walk next to people for miles. They don't know who it is. I mean, there's all kinds of strange things going on here. So that's not a full and complete answer, but that's the direction I'm going to even account for the resurrection of Jesus through uncontrolling love. Sure. One more question? Thank you very much for your talk. Sure. Just, just two quick questions. One, I wonder if you can comment on um, the miracles in the New, in the New Testament, particularly yes. you know, the healings and um, the, how that involved people's will and if yes. then, why not now? Um, and what does it say, what does your view say about our theology of prayer, like intercessory mm. prayer? Is there, is there a sense in which um, having enough wills aligned with God Mm. provide is some kind of threshold beyond which yeah. that unleashes God's power or something? Um, These are two real easy yeah. ones to close with. <laughs> um, miracles. I do believe in miracles. I think that the miracles recorded in Scripture are true, at least most of them. Maybe not the axe head floating on the water. I'm not committed to that one. But um, when I read the miracles account of Jesus especially, without exception there's some reference to creaturely cooperation, or at least the possibility thereof. Oftentimes, Jesus says, your faith has made you heal, you, you, you well, or whatever. And when he goes to his hometown, it says he can't do miracles because they don't have faith. Now, I don't think that he's sort of sitting around saying, you've got to up your faith game a little bit here. I think that's a way of talking about the failure to cooperate at whatever level. Um, Nature miracles are a little harder for my proposal because I don't think the Red Sea freely says, you know, I think I'm going to part now that Moses put the stick down. Um, I've got some proposals in my book, The Uncontrolling Love of God, using chaos theory and, um, and um, quantum physics about how that might happen at the molecular level and also God being able to, you know, judge weather patterns, that sort of stuff. So I've got a, a way to account for some of those. But I want to be honest by saying those are harder for my proposal than nature miracles are. The prayer thing, I think my proposal is far better than the alternatives on that one. I think that one I can hit a home run with. <laughs> the nature miracles, uh, you know, it's harder for me. Because think about prayer. Um, if you've got a God who determines everything, then prayer doesn't make any sense. I mean, God's just going to do everything no matter what you do. In fact, God's forcing you to pray anyway, so it's just hard to get your head around it. If you've got the conventional view of God, the number two I had up here, uh, God empowers and overpowers, then you've got a God who could single-handedly bring about any circumstances so that when you're praying for Aunt Mabel's cancer, God could do that unilaterally even if you didn't pray. And assuming God's a loving God, God would do it if you didn't pray. I mean, think about that in the way we live our lives. If my daughters want something, and I know it's good for them, if they don't ask for it, I'm still inclined to give it to them if I think it's good for them. So the traditional view of God's power, I don't think makes much sense when it comes to prayer. Now, my position says this. God can't single-handedly bring about results. So when I pray for Aunt Mabel's cancer, that doesn't somehow put God on turbo charge to say, oh, I couldn't control before, but now thanks to your prayers, boom, I can. But because I think God has affected my, my prayers and I think the world is interrelated, my praying can open up possibilities for God to act in ways that may not have been possible had I not prayed. And that's why um, praying without ceasing matters because circumstances change over time and other possibilities may arise. So I think the proposal I have actually helps make sense of petitionary prayer uh, given the usual options. Thanks so much for coming out this afternoon. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. Thank you, Jeremy, and thank you, Thomas. Thank you.